Okay. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kathleen Dudley. I'm a holistic reflexologist and I am in New Mexico. But I uh, have spent uh, five years in Oregon, which is where my guest, Ron Gibson, currently lives. And so it's a pleasure to uh, welcome Ron uh, to this interview and conversation. Welcome, Ron. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, Kathleen. It's an honor. Well, it, the honor is mine. I, um, I wanted to have this conversation with Ron because what we're currently dealing with today is a government and legal system that continues to compile floors and floors of statutes and rules that uh, are intended to be there for us, but only appears to be for us, to yeah. keep us well contained and well controlled. Right. And what Ron has been doing for the past three decades plus has been educating himself and teaching others about an, all the actual constitutional law right. and common law and how we have as citizens or people living in this country um, have in essence gone to sleep about our own rights, our own birthrights, our inalienable rights, our unleanable rights. And so today we're going to talk about how to become more empowered and how to assert our rights against this very unlawful system of <clears throat> legal statutes and rules that we passively embrace. So Ron, I wondered if you could give us a little bit of your background before we start. And again, welcome. Well, thank you, Kathleen, again, <clears throat> for me, for allowing me to be on your program here today. My pleasure. Uh, to give you a little bit of insight as to Ron Gibson, uh, I grew up on a cattle ranch out in a place called Applegate, which is about 35 miles from Metford. Uh, my folks raised cattle, we raised hay, and I learned very quickly the value of the land. Every day in front of the ranch house, logging trucks would go up and come down and they would be taking timber to the mills and help people to build their dream home and all of the other items made from wood. Every day, miners would go up and down uh, the road is called Thompson Creek Road. And on weekends, we'd, my brother and I, who was older, we'd go up and go to these different mines and talk to these miners and understand, I began to realize the wealth in, that God put in, the, in the, the soil for us to use and to harvest. It, it's no different than harvesting a crop. We're harvesting minerals that makes all of the products that we need every day. Your cell phone, your computer, you know, medical implants, your glasses that you wear. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. And, and I, I grew to love the land and what it represented. And the more that I studied my Bible, the more correlation I began to see about what God intended us to do with the land. And that planted a seed in me. So after I got out of high school, I joined the Marine Corps, spent a tour in Vietnam, uh, come back and I went to uh, law school not for the purpose of becoming an attorney, because I'm not an attorney, I'm a lawyer. I deal in law, constitutional law. And I wanted to study that subject because my mother and dad were constitutionalists. And I don't mean radical, you know, we, we've so abused, you know, different terms and, and subjects and whatever. But uh, if it isn't that constitution, then our government has no right to do it. But the thing that I learned most of all going to law school is the inherent power that we have as an individual. Our constitution and our form of government is a republic form of government. It is not a democracy or is never intended to be a democracy. The definition of a democracy is two wolves 
and a baby lamb voting on what to have for lunch. And the definition of a republic is the same two wolves and the baby lamb armed with his, his uh, weapon saying, you're not having me for lunch today, tomorrow, or ever. And so th that gets into our Second Amendment. There's a purpose for that. Uh, so uh, as I began to learn and study, I had a hunger for more and more. And I've been called most of my life an informational junkie. Uh, I can't learn enough. I can't find enough, whatever. And as I began to do law research versus what was happening in our country as a slow progression, uh, I learned very quickly that statutes and codes, folks, are not law. They are corporate rules and regulations. And there's a very famous case called City versus, uh, excuse me, City of Dallas versus Mitchell. And in that co uh, case, on page three, the court makes a very profound ruling in that case. And they said that our rights don't come from government, our right comes from our creator. And we are not subject, listen to this, we are not subject to government rules and regulations unless we volunteer to be subject to those rules and regulations. So the majority of the American people over the course of time have been indoctrinated, not educated, but indoctrinated that everything government has to say, then we have to abide by that. Here's where we've come folks, and I want you to hear me very clearly. We no longer function as a nation of laws. We function as a nation of policies, rules, and procedure. That's a tremendous dangerous position to be in because when people start yielding and devoting themselves to policy, then you go back and you look at the Roman Empire and what happened there. And I'm an avid student of biblical history. I'm an avid student of world history. And then you look at the realm of Hitler and what he did, he didn't educate the children, he indoctrinated the children. And that's what our universities are now. They're not institutions of higher learning, they're institutions of more indoctrination. So to make a long story short, Kathleen, is the fact that, that as I began, the hardest thing that I had to deal with when I learned what the truth was, and I learned and remembered what I had been taught that was not the same as what the truth was, that ripped at my soul because I was taught that our government is for us, they're here to protect us, you know, policemen were here to protect us and whatever. But you'll notice police officers today are not called peace officers, they're called law enforcement. The coroner is no longer the coroner, he is called the medical examiner. And what that has done has changed the jurisdiction over these entities to where they are now being dictated to about what the, um, what do I want to call it? I want to be careful here. <laughs> about what the, the normal status quo is trying to impart upon. And I want to mention one other thing, and I hope people understand I want to talk a moment about uh, executive orders. Uh, executive orders has been so prostituted that it's pathetic. Let me tell you what the original intent of, of an executive order from the president right on down into corporations, et cetera. An executive order was structured for the purpose of the president or, the, or whatever to give directives to his immediate cabinet to carry out the business of the day. You and I are not subject to executive orders. Well, there's no law that binds us to have to obey that. And I'm getting back to the mask issue, the injections, whatever term that you wanna call that, and on and on and on it goes. And yet the whole nation is being led around by the nose now, on the basis that a governor says, and we've got a lot of problems here in Oregon, as well as many other states. We have a government, a governor, that's an absolute certified lunatic, and I'm not afraid to say it. 
that woman there is just not good for Oregon. It's not good for the people here. It's not good for our image anywhere across the nation. I just came back from a week-long seminar in Hawaii, and even people in Hawaii, oh, you got that governor, uh, ta da ta da ta da So, but anyway, that's kind of my background. Uh, I've done a lot of mining. I've been in the construction business, and especially uh, mineral development. I've worked as a consultant. I now deal in constitutional law, so I try to educate people. That's kind of my my mission the rest of my life here. So, well, that's that's so critical, particularly now. And I recall when we first spoke, you were saying that when you first were um, attempting to talk to people about this, you had very little audience. Oh boy! But. You've also indicated when we when we started our conversation today that you are seeing a slow awakening, and yeah. so your crowd of listeners is 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 broadening, and I'm I'm really grateful to you that you have managed to hang in here all this time, and wait for us to wake up so that we can now take advantage of your knowledge because we are desperately hungry to understand how to stop this tyranny, this communist takeover of this country. And we are seeing this communist takeover really ever since the Bolshevik revolution. I mean, it, it began way before then, but the Bolshevik yeah. revolution never stopped. It, yeah. it, it spread like wildfire to other countries. And, and, and one thing I, I did want to say that, you know, I know you mentioned Hitler, but Hitler was absolutely 100% against communism. He fought against communism. And even the story of the Second World War has been a total lie. And I urge people to read um, uh, Bradbury's uh, book called the, the Myth of German Villainy because it will help straighten up people's understanding and to see that the accountants are actually perpetrating a tremendous lie that has put us to sleep, just like we have been put to sleep with the constitution so that we will then embrace this, this unlawful um, uh, um, legal system, so-called legal system right. of laws and rules that, that you so well described, Ron. So, <laughs> In saying all of that, I wonder if you could perhaps talk a little bit about um, maybe the, the, the origins of how did the Constitution come into place and, and, how, and, and, and what has led to us being in the state that we're in today? And maybe just give a little bit of background so that people can, can see just what has happened so that as we all awaken, we can connect the dots with a little bit more clarity. Well, it started on the basis before there ever was a constitution, we had what's called the Federalist Papers. And the Federalist Papers by numbers spelled out what government was allowed to do and the rights of the people. And they're fascinated and I encourage people to go to your internet and look up the Federalist Papers and read those. I mean, don't just glance through it, read it, study, listen to what it says. What is it trying to, trying to convey? And then uh, they, there are groups of people that decided, or with group people within the group who decided that, well, we just made to make a constitution. The constitution is really a contract. That's what the constitution means. And what it was intended to do, there are two constitutions. Uh, there's the organic constitution, and there's what we call the volume one, which is the one that we have and that is displayed here today. But that constitution on the thing greatly limited uh, the United States government about what they could do without the approval of the people. Now, having said that, let me give you a little bit of a sidebar. Originally, the way it was designed, our government, was that Congress was to make, uh, propose the bills. The purpose of the Senate was for the purpose of, of reviewing what Congress was uh, proposing 
to make sure that our rights were not violated in any of that proposed bill that came up. That came up. It was never intended for the Senate to be doing, making up their own bills, whatever. They had other functions, but the primary purpose of the original Senate was to protect us from any unlawful or infringement from an act enacted by Congress. Once that was approved, then in essence, that proposed bill was to be sent out across the countryside and for people to vote on it. Now, boy, listen to how far we've come down the tube. Oh, wow. When have you got to vote on something yourself before it's passed in Congress and signed by the president? It was only allowed that after the people had approved it uh, by a majority vote, that the president had authorization to sign it. Nobody even knows or understands what I'm saying for the most part. So Ron, when 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 was the organic uh, constitution and then volume one put in place? And, and, and then a third question is, when did that, um, when did that change happen that Congress and the Senate were independent from the people's participation to approve by that, majority vote. That happened after the, the uh, volume one constitution, the one that we looked at there today, simply because what it did, they changed the, the title of that. The first constitution was a constitution for the United States of America. They changed one word, the constitution of the United States. That made that servient to the people who were in power. And that way that constitution could be manipulated or in fact, totally ignored. But because of the knowledge of the people, you know, right after our revolutionary war on the thing, they were very astute about what the constitution meant or was intended to mean. So this progression of changing how that was interpreted and or treated came over a long progression of time. And so now we end up today that they don't even pay attention to the constitution. And yet we come about and we make the claim, well, you're violating my constitutional right. The constitution does not provide any right. The constitution's purpose was to affirm your inalienable rights, your God-given rights. And so, you know, even the public being misinformed or misunderstanding is a very fact that now we've got a whole society of people that don't understand the document that they claim they want to, they want to protect them by. So here we are. Uh, yes. And so uh, what year was the organic constitution passed? It was 1787 was the drafting of it. And 17, I believe 1788 was the enactment of it. And then the, and then the current constitution was 1789. And actually, there were some modifications that came through it uh, until 1791 or 92. I forget the exact date on it. And that was with the Bill of Rights. That is correct. And, and uh, I've always been rather amazed at how concise and how small. Let's see, I, I have a copy of that here. It's, um, it's a, a, a teeny booklet. Exactly. And um, you know, I'm wondering how many people actually um, have read this and actually understand their constitutional rights. And I would suspect that not very many people, but part of that is because we have been dissuaded. We have been put to sleep regarding mm -hmm. the, the, what, the fact that, that no one, no one person, man or woman, has any authority over us. That is between uh, us and our creator. Amen. Kathleen, is, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, but you bring up a very interesting point. Is that the fact that nowadays when you mention that you're a sovereign, I mean, I know of a man in California got arrested because he told a police officer he was a sovereign. We are sovereigns by creation, not by association. We're sovereigns by creation, and there are sovereigns without subject, 
And boy, that's an important factor that people, you can govern you a whole lot better than I can or anyone else. And that alludes to the very point you just made. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I wanted to make that point. Thank you for underlining that and clarifying that. And I, I don't know if people truly understand the meaning of that. It's taken me a long time to really take it into the core of my very being that no one, no police officer, no judge, no, you know, no priest, no, you know, school teacher, no one has authority over me. It is truly my 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 relationship to myself and to my creator that's right. however we see that and and um that's a very big one because that means that this system of law that we are we have subjected ourselves to and i say subjected ourselves to because we don't it's not for us to abide by that's man created man-made and imposed upon us with with taxation and um and and all kinds of rules so um so ron where do we go from here knowing that we are sovereign men and women living man and living woman connected to the earth and 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 capable of you know of expressing our individuality what do we do under a system of law that is this oppressive this communist in terms of the attempt to wipe out individuality i mean all we have to do is look at the last two years and all the entrepreneurial businesses that were attacked and if we look back at the founding of this great country and across Canada and really across, across the world, it was the entrepreneurial spirit. But most importantly, in this country, the spirit of the individual, the entrepreneurial spirit was what made this country so great. And that's been the target. So would you speak to that? Yes, but before I go there, let me back up a moment. We were talking about the subject matter of jurisdiction, and I do a lot of law classes on that very subject. But there's a maxim in law that's universal, right from heaven clear down to the center of the earth or the universe, however you want to define it. But it goes like this. One can only claim jurisdiction over that which one creates. The state did not create you and I, man and woman. Uh, that's God created. Therefore, he has jurisdiction. That's why we're to serve him. And the other thing that I want to encourage you and many others, quit calling statutes and codes laws. Now, I understand the context that you said that, but we've got to quit giving credit where credit is not due, if I can put it in that context. Good point, and thank you for that. It's very and, important. And, and, I, and I don't mean to be critical at all, but I want to Language share matters. A, another parallel issue. I live in timber country here, as you well know. You know about Oregon and Idaho, Northern California and Washington, whatever. We grow massive amounts of timber. And we have much of the, of the Western states that the land has never been disposed. The government reneged on the contract on the Admissions Act for all of the Western states west of the, of, the, of the Mississippi. All of the Eastern states got all of their land disposed through what we call land patents. I've written two books. Well, well, we, I'd like to interrupt you for a second. What do you, how do you define the word disposed? What does that actually mean? Disposed means to convey from one party to another. Thank you. That it's not in a wasteful fund, it's in a positive and productive fund. If you look at Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2 of the US Constitution, you will see what we define in law as a land disposal section of the Constitution. And it talks about the obligation of government to dispose of the public lands. And I get people all the time say, well, that's Forest Service land, that's government land, that's BLM land. BS, big capital letters. 
every land law ever made is under a public land law designation. Those lands belong to you and I. And Congress has made some terrible blunders in enactments that they have done. And one of them that I want to address here for the moment is the Act of, eight, uh, of October 1976 called FLIPMA, stands for Federal Land Policy Management Act. And in that, the government claims that they now own and stole the land from you and I, the public. And then in that act, you'll read, it says we're reclaiming. My question to that is how do you reclaim something that you never owned to start with? If you read your constitution, the government cannot own land other than military bases and ammunition stockpile, ports, post offices, and other needful buildings. That's the limit of their authority. And we're not keeping our government uh, feet to the fire, if, if I can put it in that context. Yes, and very important, but you know, if you, if you pull the wool over people's eyes and you push your way in and no one resists, well, that's like a exactly. child in a candy store. That's you know, they're, you're going to dip their hands into those jelly beans one more time, and if nobody watches again, they're going to dip it in again until until they they're satiated. But you know what sweets are like? It's addicting, and one of the most addictive substances. So they're going to just keep on digging, and, and isn't that what we're seeing? Like you just said, when they push and we don't resist. A no answer is an answer. It's a yes answer. We're giving them permission to continue doing what they're doing. And sin being sin in and through the functions of ungodly people, they're going uh, to suppress us. They're going to abuse us, in which you're starting to see more and more happen every day. And one of the things that I've been fighting, I'm helping people in three different lawsuits now about the issue of foreclosure. Uh, very good. There, there is a very, very important, and people across this land have been affected or in the process of being affected or will be affected in the future. I wrote a book called Your, What You Need to Know About Land Patent, and I addressed in that a portion from about page 92 to 100 about the fact that under land law, you cannot convey land from party A to party B without a title. Now, when the so-called mortgage company comes along and says, we're going to loan you money to buy this piece of property, that's a fraud. It's an intent to commit fraud in the first instance, and it's a fraud, actual fraud in the second instance, because they don't loan you one red penny. What they do is they take your promissory note, and a promissory note can be treated that, that the courts have allowed, which is unlawful but they've allowed them to use it as a check. So what they do is they, after the, uh, on the fourth day, the three day, you have a three day period of revocation. In other words, you can withdraw your signature from that so-called contract that isn't a contract, okay? But on the fourth day, they will either cash that, that check with the International Monetary Fund, or they will monetize it, securitize it, send it to, down in Bradstreet for rating, and it goes to Wall Street, and the value of that property and that promissory note then is split up into hundreds of thousands of pieces and sold as stock. And so when a bank then comes along and forecloses on it, which they have no lawful authority to do, how is it? I want you folks to listen carefully. How is it and where is it in law that a bank can convert a mortgage to a title? Did you hear what I said? How does the bank convert a mortgage to a title? Because when they're taking that back, they're stealing your equity. They stole the value of your signature on the promissory note because the promissory note is always the value of the property. I mean, I could go on on this subject forever, and I don't mean to dominate. The point I'm trying to make here, folks, you have something to say about that, but you got to stand up and say, wait a minute, I need to learn. You just need to learn a little bit, folks, not everything. You don't need 50-year law background like I've got. That's not necessary. 
but I'm just trying to share with you, we're being duped at every turn of the road out there. Well, Ron, I want to go into the land patents in detail. So we'll we'll do that in another in, in another right. part. Uh, this will just be part one of a series. And I'll be most eager to learn. I, I think we all will, uh, because no one likes to be duped. The idea that um, you know we're we're good um, moral people who are living good lives with good values, and so when when we are we come face to face with conniving. Um, accountants, money changers, um, a, a, a system of legal um, um, orders and, and such, we, we're not made of the substance to think, oh, that's, that's, um, that's taking advantage of me. You know, right. So we just, we aren't, we aren't, put together like that. So it's, uh, it'll be important to unwind that information so that we have a step-by-step -step of, of how, to, uh, how to walk more, more carefully. Um, so what, um, in, in your book, you've written, um, have you written other books other than what you need to know about land patents? I know that you're very knowledgeable about water as well. Yes. I teach water law, I teach patent law, I teach right away uh, mining law, et cetera. I wrote another book. It's uh, called You're Not a Slave. And this is based upon the fact that you bring your land patent forward. But what I've done in this lifelong of research is that I prove that you're not obligated to pay property tax. God given rights cannot be taxed. And our right of land is God given. And therefore, not only that, if I can speak just a moment, Kathleen, Please to do. the patent. Every patent issued by the United States government uh, is what's called an allodial title. An allodial title means it is the ultimate supreme God given right. And it, the definition of allodial is owing to no one nor to any lord nor superior. Now, think about that a minute. What does that mean? That means, folks, that you are the king of your land. It's just like our Constitution. Our Constitution, when it was drafted, was not as complete as it was what we read today. The Constitution, its original writing, was sent to the Commonwealth of Delaware for signature for the representative of the Commonwealth. And they said, wait a minute, there's something missing. And they added, we the people. Now I have done extensive research to try to find out whether they knew what they were doing, they did it by divine intervention, or they did it just by accident. I don't know that answer. But what I can tell you is that we being Americans and under that constitution, we are the king of our land which means that the government is our servant, not our master. And we have allowed government to become our master. Now they become abusive as being that man. And we've let them do it, folks. And I want to emphasize again, the power that the individual has is phenomenal. It's God given. And if I can share something, Kathleen, real quick. Please do. The other day I came into my office and there are other people in, in the office complex here. And they were talking about the problems that this country is facing. And as I listened for a few minutes and I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. And behind one of the guy's desk was a whiteboard. And I said, I want you to write this down. I said, across the top in big letters, I put, put the word God. And I said, directly under that, make a little vertical line and underneath that is we the people. And underneath that, a little short line and government. And underneath that, we want to have the courts. Underneath that is others. In other words, anything that is necessary for the sake of helping 
uh, facilitate than to run the government that we the people have set up. And so I went through the authority and priority and jurisdiction of what God has, because the Bible says he made everything. He made you and I spoke in Psalm 33 and the heavens came into be and on and on and on. But I said, let me give you folks an example. Let's go back to January 6th of this year when the people rushed to the Capitol building. And, and I'm not talking about the crooks that joined in there. Please keep in mind, keep that out of this equation because I'm trying to help you understand something. We, the people, have every right to storm that Capitol building. It belongs to you and I. We are the masters, they are the servants, and whatever. And my point was, when government fails, now listen carefully, who then has to take responsibility? Then it's designed that the courts to intervene. The Supreme Court failed their job, okay? There was none other underneath that. We, the people, should have rose up as a nation and put a stop to all of this garbage because that's what they've done on the thing. And people didn't realize, well, what could I do? And then the news media says that we're all criminals because there is not a criminality at all about Russia and the capital. If you go there and destroy property, now that's a crime. But that's not the part that I'm talking about. Right, and I don't, I don't even think that those folks who, who went who were standing for we the people had any intention of that, but we do know that there are uh, insurrectionists who were put in there, who are funded by the um, by the accountants to create the trouble and the disturbances, and we see that all across the country. We see that in in Portland. And, and all of the burning and the looting. And we see that in peaceful demonstrations. And, and what well, wasn't it uh, Thomas Jefferson who said that every generation we need a revolution because mm -hmm. we must keep in check the mm -hmm. centralized government's growth. And we've had what? One revolution in this country in 200 mm -hmm. years. I think we have um, misstepped. And, and isn't this a wonderful opportunity now, Ron, for us to awaken and, and really take our, our lawful rights um, to, to, into our families, into our communities, and to stand up for our rights? Kathleen, I want to make a statement. I am not anti-government. A lot of people have called me that. I am very much in favor of a lawful government, a constitutional government that is a constant functions on the basis of a constitutional republic where rights are honored, God given rights and religion and all of that that it's intended to be. But I am adamantly opposed to tyranny of any sort. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I've seen a lot of death in my life. And if you want folks don't understand what communism and socialism does, I'm telling you, go, go to your history book and take a look. And, and, and many other nations uh, before. We have a problem in this country, folks, that we had better get a handle on very quickly or we're gonna lose it. And I'm gonna tell you something, when you lose it, you never can get it back. And boy, I mean to tell you, it's gonna get ugly and it's getting uglier by the day. Well, it is. And if you look at the history of this country and you look at, bless you, if you look at, I believe, it is like 227 years of wars in this country that has been around for what, 239 years? Yeah. Well, there is no what such thing. What that, that tells us is that, is that the accountants who establish and perpetrate these wars are making a great deal of money. Money, there you go. And, 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 it's, and, 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 and the cannon fodder are our men. Look at how many deaths of our men Amen. and the maiming of our men. And what happens when our men are killed and, and they're maimed? Who is put on the front lines? It's our mothers, it's our women, it's the children. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so that's the cry that is of, of the crimes against humanity that have been ongoing. 
And so thank you for, for, for talking about that because it's, um, most people don't understand that these wars are intentional and they're, and they're profit gaining wars. And, and we, have, we have been hoodwinked again and again exactly. and again. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, if you go back in biblical history and, and you read, wealth used to be measured by land ownership, cattle, uh, sheep, goats, camels, what, whatever. And it wasn't until Julius Caesar's reign that he changed that and said, now wealth is determined by money. And we have adopted that worldwide and we have now made money our God. And if you read the Ten Commandments in the Bible, it says very clearly, God says, thou shall not have any gods before me. I'm a jealous God. And we've pushed them aside and held up this element of money. And, you know, I, uh, I tell people, I know of an incident where a man prayed for a fellow churchgoer on Sunday, and he prayed upon him Monday through Saturday, if you hear what I'm saying. Yes. Yes. Well, so, so that's an interesting point that the wealth uh, shift and, and at the same time, look at what we're seeing in terms of land ownership today and mm -hmm. the large pieces of land that are being bought up by major corporations and major yeah, players. And, for and foreigners and foreigners as well. And so, I, I, you know, I, I remember it's been at least a decade uh, when I would travel uh, up into Southern Cal uh, Colorado and I would see these very large, beautiful uh, ranches and farms that were up for sale mm -hmm. and, and was hearing that those were being bought by very large corporations, mm -hmm. moving out of the hands of, of, of you and I. And um, and so the shift of wealth has been dramatic, and we see that tremendously over the last couple of years. And and as you're talking about the lawsuits that you're working on for um, uh, people landowners for landowners, yeah. exactly. so it it's um it appears it appears that this continuity of of stripping the wealth, um, you know that we see it's like a, a, a monarchy, this tyranny, this dictatorship system of the powers that be. Yes, please hold that up higher. Uh, I, I want to refer to this just to illustrate the point that you're, you're making. Uh, taxes on property tax, a lodial patented land was to never be taxed, okay? Why? Because it's God-given. You can't take a God-given right and tax it. But in, here's what they're doing, Kathleen. And boy, people need to understand that. The tax system through this ungodly process that we're having to deal with, they raise the taxes purposely so that they can wipe out that level of people who just hanging on financially by the skin of their teeth, as I can put it in that context. And when they strip them of all that land, then it moves up to the next level. And then they will raise the taxes again. Then they will strip those. It takes time, but the whole, that's intended to do that on purpose. So that you and I, one day, unless you're the part of the elite, you will never own land. And it will all be done for the most part through unlawful taxation. That's what this book is about. So, Ron, um, a couple of things about that. I mean, we've heard um, um, Klaus Schwab say with the um, European World Economic Forum, you will own nothing and you will be happy. And that is a very powerful communist statement. And, and, that, and that's exactly what they're saying. And, and they're content with that, saying that. That doesn't bother them at all. And so... So how is it 
that there can be a system of, of rules and, um, and um, orders, well, rules that actually put people into a place of servitude that they actually pay these unlawful taxes to centralized governments that right. are running rock shop over the people. What, uh, how, how, how is it that, that that's happening and what do we do? What are some solutions here? How do we, um, how do we change the course of this um, unfolding? Kathleen, I come back to my original statement, and I hope folks will hear what I'm trying to say. One of the big problems that we have, uh, well, actually two. Uh, number one is our law enforcement, our, our so-called public servants are no longer public servants. Out on the highway, they're mobile revenue agents. Other than that, they're pirates that are robbing the people. The second big problem we have is the court system. The court system has become an absolute den of thieves because now we, and I just did a law class uh, on the power of the sheriff and we in our law group here uh, had in invited 11 different county sheriffs to come and let me teach them about the, the power of the sheriff. Not one accepted, not one sheriff's office or their their, their, their deputies, they didn't want to hear anything about because the power of the sheriff is based upon a constitutional base. Uh, we have a right to be protected from the unlawful uh, rulings of the court and also from the rulings that are, are unlawful from the state legislature. Now the question is, where's our firewall between being victims to the sheriffs, the courts, and the state legislature. We don't have it. We are standing. That's why the power of the people have to stand together. If you don't have a group, start a group. But folks, do something. You know, you don't have to know it all, but be willing to do something. And what you'll find, there's an old saying that I have. When the patriot undertakes a long and dangerous endeavor, he walks that lonely road alone. But when he begins to succeed, many will join him because it costs them nothing. And isn't that true what you are seeing for your own self, that here Amen. we are, here I, I am together with you, being able to get this information out and more and more of us will become empowered through this. Kathleen, I spent the last 35 years yeah, maybe a little more, but let's call it 35 years. Standing on the rooftop screaming at the top of my voice, people start looking, here's a problem, you know, offering law classes, whatever. And it just fell on deaf ear. This last election, really a lot of people woke up about how bad the corruption is. And they're just it's it's overwhelming or just across the nation. I get 70, 80 phone calls a day. I get two or 300 emails a day of people, Ron, thank you for this. How can I do? Where can I contact? All of this stuff. I mean, it's just overwhelming to me when I stood there for so many years and just screams at the top of my voice. And, and, and boy, I felt alone because I, for the most part, I was. Yes. But now... God is blessing that, and you know, this. I'm, I'm I'm just thankful for you that allow me to come on a program there that gets out to other people. It's all parts of links of the chain, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. Well, I, I you know, I, I know how much. Well, I don't know if I know exactly, but I know it takes tremendous courage and tenacity, and obviously education, and 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 an alignment uh, to truth and to goodness and to life and love. And, and that's what you embody. And, and that is a very powerful attraction. 
So those of us who also embody that will be drawn to you and more and more of us are finding you. So it's, it's my honor to be able to have this conversation with you, Ron. I, I also wanted to mention, um, I have a, a dear friend who lives in Applegate and um, yes, and uh, another friend who's not that far from there. And then some other people that I've worked with to do educational conferences to bring constitutional sheriffs together. One that was done up in Washington. Uh, a number of them are happening in Oregon, actually, in, in, in your neck of the woods. And then you probably know well of Sheriff Mack. Oh, yes. Who has been a part of our conferences. And I worked with him on his Virginia conference. And so, yeah. of course, it's difficult to bring these sheriffs together because many of them have already become the puppets of the, um, of the tyrants. And if they're not firmly um, rooted in the constitution, they already are on the pay roll and, um, and, and a part of the problem. So the more we do engage, as you say, build a community group, bring in your local sheriff, help educate, because many of them don't understand. They took the oath. Even the sheriff, even the sheriff, don't know what the law is. All they've been taught is, and I'm not throwing stones at them because they only know what they know. But instead of teaching them law, they're indoctrinating them with policy. Boy, be careful with that issue. Policy will destroy you. Yes, and so it's about standing within your jurisdiction, is it not? Right. Exactly. So if we understand our jurisdiction and we stand from a place of education and we, we, we hold to that in our conversation, that's when it can become a meaningful conversation that, that's educational. Um, so how, um, how, do we, how do we truly um, find the ABCs of how to um, learn about our rights? What would your direction be for us in terms of, um, you know, your website? Um, your, your, you've given us the names of two of your books, and where are those available, Ron, so that we can uh, reach, get a hold of copies of those? So it's um, you are not a slave, and um, what you need to know about land patent, because of course, reading. And educating ourselves is the precursor to knowledge, is it not? Well, there are two means that you can acquire my books. I'm on my third book. I'm not done yet, just because I haven't had the time. That's lately, the last two years or so to work on. But uh, I'll give you my uh, my address that you can order them directly from me, or you, and that's Ron Gibson. Eleven. North, that's an N with a period, Peach Street, like a fruit you eat off a tree. That's Medford, Oregon, M-E-D-F-O-R-D. -E and the zip is 97530. No, excuse me, 97501. Sorry about that. 97501. Okay. Or you can go to austinmeetinggroup.com and you can order them through uh, there was part of that is my website and uh, so you can order the books from either one of those sources okay very good and so as but far the, the, two, the books are 45 dollars each includes the mailing uh, but I don't think you'll be disappointed because in my books both of them are loaded 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 with case law and I, the reason that I did that, I didn't want somebody coming up to me later on and say, well, Ron, that's just your opinion. What's in this book is not my opinion. That uh, I, I'm a law guy. So I went to the law to back up everything that I say in the books. So anyway. Very fine. And, and what's interesting is that we, you know, the, these, these laws you know, the case laws have been established uh, under this um, contract jurisdiction, <laughs> but but.
from what you were saying, in particular, um, you had mentioned the uh, a government ruling of City of Dallas versus Mitchell. That's correct. That that, that statute ruling um, underlines our rights to our property. Exactly. Exactly. So and that case law the, matters. That's the fundamental issue. If you lose your property, you lose your rights. <laughs> when patents are issued, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. When patents are issued, not only does the, the grantee is the grantee is the recipient of that document, the also comes with that issue to that allodial title is what we define as a bundle of rights. Those rights are defined as vested rights. Very important folks, vested means that they're in law. They're not a something that's permission that's given to you. They're God given rights, our bill of rights, if I can use that as the example, because that's what it is. But they can never be altered. They can never be diminished. They cannot be taken away from you, as well as the land patent that comes that I wrote the, the book about. That land patent that says on every patent it is there granted to the undersigned, to their heirs, and assigned forever. That's a forever document. And the attorneys nowadays and in law school, they say, well, those patents don't mean anything. They're, they're, they're old stuff. Uh, we don't recognize them. They better recognize them because they're forever, because God's word is forever. He's the one that gave us the right to own the land, and he also is a protector of the land and provides the rain and the sunshine and to put the minerals and on and on it goes. You see what I'm, where I'm going with that. But all I'm trying to share with you is that those vested rights are priceless. They're priceless. And if you allow your country to be taken over by socialism, communism, by whatever term you want to use, and that land right is taken away because nobody wants to stand up and defend it, we are in deep doo-doo. Yes, I, I am well stated <clears throat> and potent, Ron. How do we stand up? How, how do we stand up, Ron? What, I mean, obviously we, you know, this is a war against humanity, a war against Christianity, a, a spiritual war. This is a war against our, our birthrights, uh, our, our, our freedom, our, um, our capacity as individuals to thrive. Our life, liberty, and property is under attack. So what do we do? It's not like there are tanks in the fields and paratroopers coming out of planes and bombs being dropped. It's a silent war. But is it, you know, most, most of the people that I see walking the streets are seem oblivious to the fact that we're under war. This is third world war. This is the biggest war of humankind. That's so right. what, do we, what do we do, Ron? Well, let me make a statement. First of all, my Bible tells me that in the last days, Satan will blind their eyes. And we have a whole nation of people that I consider to have their eyes blinded by false information or by complacency or by whatever means. But to answer your direct question, as I mentioned before, you need to seek out people who are learned in the Constitution, and they're out there. There are many people that do exactly what I do out there, and get a hold of them, ask around, and start inviting people to come and have somebody teach you about. It, it's one thing, I've got numerous copies of the Constitution here. It's one thing to read the Constitution, folks, but it's something else to understand it. Are, are you with me on that? Yes, and could you could you explain and maybe even um, lead us to a, a really fine um, reference to understanding the Constitution? Well, for, first of all, let's go to Article One of the Constitution. That's our freedom, so. freedom of religion, 
It's our right of assembly. All of those things that are God given. And number one, we're not speaking up. We shoot our mouth off a lot, but we're talking about the wrong thing for the wrong reason. The other thing of it is that we don't stand up because we don't look up. You know, there's an old saying, first we need to look up and then the thing to stand up and then take a step forward to doing that which needs to be addressed to correct the problem. Uh, I have a saying, there's three types of people I've learned in the world. Those who make things happen, Number two, those who watch things happen. And number three category is those who look around one day and wonder what happened. My, and we kind of chuckle at that, but folks, which one are you? Which one are you? And to answer your question, Kathleen, is that there are leaders among the people that are listening and watching your program here today. They're out there, but they need support. And if you know something about the Constitution, and I mean know something, not a blowhard, we don't need any of that, too much of that already. But see if that person would hold a, a class. When you learn that Constitution, boy, it will empower you beyond your, beyond your wildest dreams, because that's the foundation of the rights and the privileges that God has given us. And that, see, the Constitution is based upon Scripture. The Bill of Rights is based upon scripture. Our flag is based upon scripture. So, boy, I think we're going to stand before Almighty God one day and give an account of what we did with those blessings that God gave us. And I hope that there are none of you that hang your head because you did nothing. There's a philosophy, the philosophy of the schools today will be the philosophy of government tomorrow. And we better wake up to that fact because we're seeing the manifestation of that indoctrination of class, uh, grade school, high school, and college classes. And it's in government and it's infiltrated to the point that it's a cancer. It's eating us alive. So, but to answer that question, so seek somebody out to be a leader of that group now, when I say that, here's what you need to do. You need to do some homework and make sure that what that person is telling you is in fact correct. And it's amazing how you empower yourself as an individual when you start seeking godly knowledge and wisdom. Jesus said, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. Okay? There's so, a message in that too. So what you're saying is, we have to be discerning. We yeah. have to understand authenticity. And we our must, role. And our role. And our role. And we must not be, be um, duped, connived by those who are there amongst us who are willingly wanting to be treacherous and take from us. So we, we must align deeply within our own core person to be able to understand that. Like, I see the authenticity in you and you see the authenticity in me, but we must take that further and be able to walk out among the people and, and see that authentic person and, and know who we are going to align with. Could you speak a little to that? Right. Oh, boy, that, that, there's a whole lot of truth to that point. Be careful who you get. Don't jump into something blindly. Ask questions. You know, God gave us a miraculous uh, gift, and that's called our, our, our conscience and our ability to discern. And we don't use it enough, folks. <clears throat> what Kathleen that's is true. talking about is exactly the point. Because if you're not careful... There's somebody out there going to grab you right by the nose and lead you down the primrose path to destruction. And there are lots of them out there. So your point about discernment is very, very, very important. So, but it, it, if, if I can digress a moment, I helped the lady with her land patent down in, in Placerville, California several years ago. And, uh, she grasped the concept of 
being the king of her land. I mean, you can be a king and be a woman. I mean, the, the gender issue in that context is irrelevant. But the point being is that she grasped that. Well, we had an instance where a buck got hung up in her fence and the forest became there and they were gonna cut her fences and all of this stuff and whatever. And she said, no, you're not. Not that she wasn't trying to help. She said, there's a better way to get that buck it was hung up in the wire on the thing. And after that whole incident, it was on national television and everything else. But after that, she called and told me, she said, Ron, I've never felt so empowered in my entire life that I'm the king of my land. And I proved it today and they had to back off from what they were gonna tell me they were gonna do. I said, no, I'm gonna tell you what you are gonna do and what you're not gonna do. And the only point I bring that up, just to illustrate uh, the point, when you arm yourself, first of all, with the word of God and we exercise his principles, it is amazing. I've been a marriage counselor off and on for about 30 years. And uh, amazing what you learn about human character. But the point I want to make, God gives us three principles to communicate by, and this works everywhere, folks. Is it, is it the right time? The second one, is it done in kindness? You can be whopping mad and still communicate in kindness. And the third one, is it necessary? And that applies to meeting groups. It applies to discussions in government and in churches and the home, the family, whatever on the thing. We need to learn to communicate God's way. And there's productivity that comes out of that and benefit and blessing if we'll do it his way. We've gotten so independent, we want to do everything our own way. And we're scattered all over the country. And we build a, or buy a house next to a neighbor, and we build an eight-foot fence because we don't want to look at it. For him looking at, then why did you move to the city? I mean, you see the point I'm trying to make here. And uh, it applies throughout life. But you need to get a group going that is headed in the right direction, and the people make sure that whoever is leading that group, and don't depend upon them solely. You can help and research and other things because that expands that group's knowledge and base and effectiveness. So, yes, well, I thank you for that and all of those points. And, you know, I think a lot of times we are so indoctrinated into thinking that we must give away our authority. Exactly. And, and, and that hierarchical structure that we've been taught through corporate uh, uh, creation um that that are you know an arm of the government and yet these associations that we would have and 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 how this country was first established with associations is very important where we're all associates and that there's there's no one that is at the pinnacle we, there's not a ceo exactly. we all are equal and we all make make decisions and it's done through consensus and it's it can take time, but it's really important because if we don't do it that way, we give up our power to someone else. And ultimately we end up seeing what is taking place today. And that is the, 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 the pure and, 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 and absolute um, stealing of our freedoms. You know, Kathleen, you, you mentioned something that I want to expand on. There isn't a person out there that can't contribute something. None of you are void of having something constructive. So if you think you're not worth anything, you don't contribute nothing, you don't know nothing, how that's the blindness of Satan blinds your eye. You have tremendous God-given gifts and abilities, then exercise them. Let that 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 gifts grow and be productive for not only yourself but your fellow man. And that's how we cure these problems. If we depend upon government, uh, we're, we're doomed already. Well, isn't that the beauty of individuality, which you pointed Amen. out so eloquently at the beginning of our conversation, that, that this republic is dependent upon individuals. It's not about putting everybody together and mixing them all up into a big cauldron and coming out with, with mush. 
we we are great. Uh, de Tocqueville spoke about that when he spent three years in this country, and 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 was totally impressed with the American people and their spirit and their capacity, and um, and 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 thought how unique this country is because of the individuals. So. Um, it's a beautiful thing to know that each and every one of us embodies um, contribution that will bring about this good over evil um, victory. And we must rely upon each one of us to contribute and to take action. Now, Ron, if you could maybe just do a quick summary of this first part of our series, and uh, then we'll be able to sit back and chew on this for a while. <laughs> well, I guess if I were to summarize it, I hope that your comments and mine uh, at least creates an additional awakening. Uh, and not only that, but an inspiration. There's an old saying, it's wonderful to have encouragement with skin on it. And uh, that means that you and I to encourage each other. And that's scriptural. You know, there are a lot of people out there feel that they're alone, and many of them are alone. But if we'll stand together with them, it's amazing the camaraderie. I'm a former United States Marine, and we have a saying called Semper Fi, means always faithful. Uh, and, and when you have that attitude of protecting the other person, and that's what I try to teach people in marriage of the fact, the number one obligation that the husband and the wife have to each other is do everything you can. I get people say, well, you know, I'll meet them 50-50. If you do that and think that you're doomed already because there's a crack there, okay? But when you're joined 100%, 100%, and that applies not only to the family or marriage or relationship, but the relationship with people in society as well. Give your all. Bible says, given it shall be given unto you. We want to take first, and then maybe we'll give something back. It don't work like that. So anyway, I guess that's hopefully is an encouragement to your listeners, uh, Kathleen. And I thank you, the bottom of my heart, for allowing me to be here. Hope you'll have me back. Well, I am so looking forward to our next conversation, Ron. And, and you know, it, it's, it has to add to your, your, your summary, there has been a tremendous effort with, uh, with the new age movement, the introduction of feminism, um, the 1960s and the drugs and rock and roll, uh, the, the infiltration of pornography, the, the total close down of the last two years of our, of our churches and, and, right. and, 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 and our inability to be able to gather together and communicate for good communication and sharing ideas and that all goes to the destruction of something so beautiful and sacred as life and relationship and our connection to nature. So um, we're going we're, we're going to turn this all around and I'm just delighted to have these conversations. So thank you and until next time, Ron Gibson and look forward to our next conversation. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. What an honor. <laughs>